All right, welcome to the Young IPA Podcast. I'm James. This is Pete. G'day, everyone. It is the 25th of June. I wrote May for some reason, but it's June, and it is episode 115 of the show. We've got a big show for you guys coming up. We're going to be talking to former Howard Minister Nick Minchin, now with Responsible Wagering Australia. Uh, we're going to be, like, that's our last interview from the Freeman Conference that I was at a few weeks ago. Where Bolt went rogue. Bolt went rogue, uh, and I... You know, as rogue as I get is talking to former Howard ministers yeah. about uh, the future of sports gambling in Australia. You're crazy. Mate. So, uh, yeah, we talk about that. We talk about all the regulations that come across it. So for all new listeners from the Joffrey interview, you know, you're not giving up on sports content just yet. So mm-hmm. we're talking about the future of sports gambling and uh, basically the syntaxes around that and also what Nick Minchin thought of the election. And we're also doing a get to know your IPA staff segment. We haven't done one of those for a while and they're always fun. Diana Vonich, who's just recently joined us. So we're going to be uh, talking to her about why she wanted to work at the IPA, her stoush online with Clementine Ford mm-hmm. and her bunny Attila the Bun, which mm-hmm. I maintain is the best name for an animal I've heard for a very long time. It's not bad. It's, it's pretty bad. good. Uh, so yeah, we should probably lead off with that because last week, uh, was pretty big, uh, mm-hmm. three, two episodes for you guys, three interviews. Uh, don't, don't say, say we don't care. <laughs> two episodes <laughs> in one week. Two episodes in one week. Pete Jeez. nearly came back into the office. It was huge. Yes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we had Joffre on the show. That was awesome. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to listen to it, go back and listen to it. It's really good. Uh, talking about the AFL's crackdown on fan behavior and some of the wider issues as well about yep. that. A lot of, um, you know, the cultural elites looking down on regular people. And if you are new to the show and if you've come to it from the Joffrey interview, welcome. Uh, please stick around because, you know, this podcast is a bunch of fun. We've got a lot of interviews like that. And uh, first time I think the podcast got covered in the Herald Sun and it got circulated to all the other News Limited websites as well. Yeah, I think it's been on your on Andrew Bolt's blog before yeah. through a bit of nepotism, but yeah. um, this was... Um, this was earned. This was Yeah, this was earned. This was nothing by blood right. Yeah, I exactly get, right. It's, it's, a, it's a different feeling for it, me. It was a genuine mention. Yeah, so uh, my first question to you is, Let's start off the show, Pete. Was okay. is this fame? Um, I don't know. Mm. I don't think so. It doesn't feel any different. Doesn't, no, I don't. I'm certainly not happier. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. I don't think so. I haven't spiraled out of control. Okay. In a dr- yeah. Haze of drug and alcohol, like most famous people do. Uh, but. And we are looking forward to that. I think that's going to really put the podcast on another level. When it's is like, that going to happen? Yeah, the Libertine second album when it was just all of the fracturing seams. Uh, so yeah. that's something to look forward to. Wow. Well, um, uh, one I'm day forward you'll forward get famous, and then we can really start to. Get good at that. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, let's talk about some of the big issues in the world this week. And I think the one that's been... You good? Yeah, sorry, (laughs) just... Saul's got me. <laughs> yep. All right, Saul's just uh, clowning around behind the scenes here. Yep. Uh, all right, so yeah, subscribe on YouTube just to see Pete just <laughs> completely yep. drift off halfway through me talking to him. It happens a lot. It happens a lot, uh, and I don't blame you. But we should talk about the main issue in Australia this week, which was the Israel Folau okay. saga. So if you guys don't know what's happened, uh, it's basically so Israel Folau is was crowdsourcing mm-hmm. oh still is crowdsourcing for his legal fees up against rugby australia for dating back to that famous instagram post mm-hmm. and he was raising through the website gofundme which is you know you put up a campaign you set a target and then people with GoFundMe memberships can uh, give you money based on that. And yeah. GoFundMe have... People what? know how Gunf- GoFundMe works. Do they work? <laughs> yeah. All right, fine. I'll <laughs> skip this part. Anyway, so GoFundMe. Anyway, uh, well, apparently not everyone knows how GoFundMe works because okay. Israel Folau probably could have read the terms and conditions wow. a bit closer. There you go. And he wouldn't have been in this. Everybody but except Frizzy. Well, that's uh, the thing. Sorry, he gets his account taken down from GoFundMe and... What do we think about that? Well, I mean, look... Uh, I mean, because uh, they say, as a company, we're absolutely committed to the fight for equality for LGBTIQ plus people and, foster- and fostering environment inclusivity. And that's why they got rid of the Israel for Lau campaign. That's exactly right. And, and he had $750,000 that been raised at that point, which they returned to the donors. Yeah. Um, look, obviously, GoFundMe can do whatever they want. They're a private company, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we always say that. But if you know you can't say that you're committed to fostering an environment of inclusivity, yeah. When you kick off someone because you don't like what they've said, they're, they're no, they're very inclusive to people that they agree that with. they agree with. Yes. Yes. thank you for stealing so, my jokes. Just walking <laughs> over the, the end of your <laughs> yeah, yeah. punchline there. Um, but that's the thing. It's like it, it's another one, and I think probably the first major profile Australian case of social media companies just going, "This is what's acceptable now." And anything out of that, you can't use our gigantic platforms. Yeah, and and I think there's, I mean, this is across all, you know, Rugby Australia think they're being diverse, but they're not, you know, big corporates think they're being diverse, but they're not. What, yep. The diversity crowd 
don't want actual diversity. They want skin deep diversity. So people that are exactly the same in every single way, but you know, you've got an Aboriginal one and a woman and a lesbian and a, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Actual diversity is uh, there's people like Israel Flair in the world. Yes. And there's people like Richard Di Natale in the world. Yeah. And there's people like us. Oh. So, I mean, yeah, that's, but that's real. <laughs> that is real diversity. Yeah. So, um, that's what you've got to deal with. There's been more developments, though. Yes. Uh, so, today, Australian Christian Lobby has launched a new fundraising website for Israel for Lau. So, you know, for people that do want to donate to Israel for Lau, because I don't think the people that got their money back from GoFundMe are just like, well, this has gone back in my back pocket. We tried. <laughs> yeah, we tried and failed. Uh, and I've seen the light now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I think, like, Israel for Lau, the people that want to donate to Israel for Lau are going to find a way to donate to Israel for Lau. Mm-hmm. Like, this isn't something that big tech can undo. Mm-hmm. Um, the other interesting thing for me is uh, there's an active GoFundMe set up in Britain which is against Israel Folau, which is, is just like raising money to say Israel Folau's a jerk. <laughs> is that that's what? okay. I did not know about that. What, that's, what are they sitting on at the moment? Uh, I th- uh, only a couple thousand, but okay. like that's okay. But Israel Folau can't raise money to defend himself. Yeah, well, I mean, look, and GoFundMe, as we know, allowed Egg Boy to raise exactly. money, who actually, you know, committed a very minor piece of violence, but a piece yeah. of violence nonetheless. Which I think another guy had a GoFundMe campaign. It didn't work out for him, but it was just to buy a Ferrari. Really? Yeah. <laughs> like, these are these are worthwhile campaigns, but the second Israel Folau wants to have a stash with Rugby Australia, they come down. The other interesting thing for me is, like, is this... Uh, how does this go down with the Australian public? Because, you know... I don't think what Israel Folau said holds like uh, I don't I don't think a lot of people agree with it. No. Certainly, I don't agree with it. No, but what he's had to go through because of what he wrote on Instagram, like potentially losing his job, potentially losing his contract. Now yeah. he can't. Now he's uh, not allowed on GoFundMe. He's getting pilloried all over their social media. I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, exactly. And we saw that that uh, poll, and I forget the stats, whatever they were. Yeah. And, but there was, you know, 80% of people, or higher than that, 95% of people don't agree with Israel Folau, but 80% of people think he shouldn't have got sacked or whatever yes. it was, you know. So people are happy to, you know, have views they disagree with and people not have massive repercussions for them. Yeah. We did see, uh, that went on the Australian Christian Lobby this morning, a new, Go, uh, new GoFundMe thing, not GoFundMe, but mm. what it's called? Yeah. Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. That's right. So that's, that's raised money. Uh, I want to talk about Maria Falau, okay. who is uh, a netball star, which I didn't realise. She's a netball star for the Adelaide Thunderbirds, Israel Falau's wife. Uh, now, she reposted Israel's post asking for money. Uh, and Liz Alice, who is um, Australia's most capped netball player, said um, to the – so she, this is to the statement from the netball body – yeah, nah, not good enough. How about this? There is no room for homophobia in our game. Anyone who's sub- seen to support or endorse homophobia is not welcome. As much as I love watching Maria Falau play netball, I do not want my sport endorsing the views of her husband. So that came after a statement from the netball body saying they weren't going to take action of her, on her for reposting that. Yeah. So, man, look, you can't even put something in support of your husband now exactly. without people coming after you. Exactly. And I don't know what's going to happen to her. Like they, the netball body might end up just folding. Yeah, uh, and this brings me back to the thesis I've had since this Israel Folau thing started, mm-hmm. which is as a society we need to stop caring what sports does. <laughs> yeah, well, and look, that's I don't I don't disagree. Just put, just put the rugby ball behind that line there, yeah. and then tackle the other guy that's trying to stop <laughs> trying to put the ball on the other line. Yeah, and that's all we need from you. And Maria's got to make sure she doesn't step. Yeah, because I played a bit of mixed oh, netball. It's every the time worst. You get the ball, Step. Sorry. I, okay, this is my rant. I, netball, I netball is basketball with all the fun parts taken out. You well, can't dribble. You can't, can't dunk, dunk. You can't shoot threes. Yeah, it's look. It's a played, fun mixed sport. I'll grant you that. But it's basketball with all the fun parts taken out. When I played basketball, I used to dunk all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and in netball, they don't you. let me do it. Anyway, uh, um, we don't mind netball. That that is going to cause some email. So I'm picturing it now. But I do believe that. Anyway, uh, let us talk red tape. Yep, let's do it. Uh, so Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced yesterday his government's plan to reduce red tape, inform, uh, reform industrial relations and reduce income taxes. Of course, Australia cost the Australia, uh, red tape costs the Australian people $176 billion each year. Now, I did some original research for this podcast, James, Jeez. some original research, and I worked out that that, that that is $7,154.47 a year for each Australian. I want to become Per-year. a te- better teammate, but there's nothing more than I want in this world than to you be wrong about that. I don't know why, but it would be so funny to me <laughs> Well, <laughs> for you to be wrong about that. Unfortunately for you, James, I'm not wrong. Damn it. I just went on Google and then got my calculator out. Yep. Uh, so Daniel Wild welcomed the announcement from the Prime Minister and the Treasurer saying this was an example of the economic leadership and ambition that Australia needs. He went on to say, or the IPA says, we should implement a one-in-two-out approach to new regulation, abolish section 487 
of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is the thing that they use to challenge things like Adani and remove the need for government approval of major projects. Yeah. I was just going to say, he didn't quote the IPA in that speech, but this is a big win for the IPA. Like, if there's one thing we've been talking about for the last two years, it's red tape. Oh, we and love it. To get a Prime Minister to t- say Actually, that. Actually, we hate it. Good. We like talking about it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, to get a Prime Minister saying this and you know using some of the phrases that we've been using is a big yep. win for the IPA. So Fantastic. I'm chalking that one up on the whiteboard as big victory. Put it on the whiteboard and I'll just make one final point on this. We talk about these economic policies. It actually is really important for the most marginalised groups in society. We've seen since Trump made those changes in the US that African-American unemployment reached its lowest point ever. And of course, there's a few factors for that, but cutting red tape helps. Yep. So that's why we talk about it so much, not Absolutely. because it helps rich people. Yes, exactly. Um, speaking of rich people, though, uh, so Facebook has... Very right, rich. All right, everyone get ready, because this is another round of James and Pete pretending what they know a cryptocurrency is. Oh, I know what it is. It's, <laughs> I definitely know that there's a blockchain. Uh, so bear with us while we get through this, because yeah. there is some good stuff at the end. But anyway, Facebook has unveiled uh, plans for a new cryptocurrency called Libra. Yeah, don't and get it mixed up with the tampon company. Did that feel good? It did. Yeah. Making, them, making the most obvious joke in the world. How that, how'd that feel? I thought like you wouldn't have heard of it. Pumping. Yeah, that was good. People anyway, out there would have laughed. Uh, so Facebook unveils plans for a new cryptocurrency called Libra. It is, um, you know, basically like Facebook's own coin. You can mm. send this coin through Messenger and WhatsApp and you can pay for things through Facebook using this coin. Currency. Currency. Not yeah. that. Not uh, an actual coin. Not an actual coin. Uh, so it's like their statement is success will mean that a person working abroad has a fast and simple way to send money to family back home and a college student can pay their rent as easily as they can buy a coffee. Uh, for, for me, it's just like, it's still very early days. They're only at a white paper stage. It won't be rolled out for quite a while, but never bet against Facebook. They were always right. <laughs> They've killed <laughs> off every one of their competition. This yeah. will be a thing. And uh, Facebook will one day rule us all. Well, that's not, that's not the line, James. I think Facebook will one day... Like, they can. They're a very good company, but they will one day rule us all. Well, the thing, one of the things... Because this was an article by Chris Berg, Jason Potts, and Sinclair Davidson in the Fin, and one of the things from the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, and one of the things they said was that actually a lot of tech companies are planning to launch their own currencies. Yeah. So there's going to be this competition. It's a private international reserve currency, so it's a bit like the old gold reserve. Um, there's more details in the article if you want to get right deep into that. But no, I think this is great. This is going to challenge the international monetary system. You know, we're going to be able to unbank the unbanked, as you said. Yep. Bank the unbanked, as you said. And, uh, as I said. <laughs> yeah, I think you said that, didn't you? Uh, well, I might have, well, it sounds oh, smart, well, you're so talking about the remittances. It. Yeah, but the remittances is great for, you know, because remitt- remittances cost heaps. Yep. And it's a really good way for people in richer countries to help people in poorer countries. So this is a good thing. Okay, that's a good point. But Mark Zuckerberg... Uh, you know, th- what Facebook does to voices that they don't like, mm-hmm. I don't also like them having purse strings of people they don't like. Well, <laughs> you don't have to use this, but... I, I know, but I'm just saying, I don't think... Like, I, this is a good thing in the sense of, uh, you know, this whole new way of doing business and the ability to, you know, rich c- poor countries. I get all that, mm-hmm. but Facebook, man. The thing is, the other thing about this, James, is Facebook is just one seat at the table. There's a whole consortium of companies. It's a Facebook-led led consortium. Yeah. But it's led by Facebook. Look, I, I'm a free market guy. They can do what they want. No one should stop them doing this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, just to get, sit back and go like, this is the best thing in the world. Yeah. Man, Mark Zuckerberg. I, I just don't like him having that much uh, knowledge. Like they know literally everything about me. And now mm-hmm. they also are going to know how much money I have. You don't need a Facebook account. Yeah, but I, <laughs> how else am I going to know when it. events are and when birthdays are and good memes? People will text you. Oh, what? If, you're good, if you're entertaining enough at parties, people will text you. Um, I'm, I'm finished. No, this is a very good thing. Don't listen to James. Uh, and of course, the major point of this article that they said was that Australia, this has been launched in Switzerland because mm-hmm. Switzerland has great financial regulations and Australia should adopt better financial regulations so that we can become a currency haven because there's going to be heaps of these. Yeah. It's going to be great. I'd love to be a tax haven. That'd be fun. Oh, same, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Like in a tax haven, not, yeah, a, yeah. not an actual one. All right, well, we'll, should, we'll get the boys on at some point to talk through that a bit more. Well, yeah, I was going to say, so looking forward podcast last week, the regular one, not the special edition with Peter Reid. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you've listened to both by now, but the regular one gets into... Well, you've got Chris and Sinclair Davidson who've worked in blockchain now for a couple of years and they get really into the ways of like, what does this mean? Yep. What, what, where's that going? So, uh, yeah, if you re- want to hear some real experts go at it about what this is, yeah. uh, go download last week's Looking Forward. Not that we're not experts. but I don't think we're experts on but, cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I, all I'm imagining is Chris Berg listening to this, absolutely slamming his head against the steering wheel, just going like, "Why don't these guys get it?" I read the article like three times. <laughs> I'm very proud. It's of not you. a cryptocurrency; it's a private international currency reserve. All right, fair enough. That's um, my one. 
Okay, uh, shall we move on to ITV in the UK? ITV all-male riding teams, ITV in the UK, Sasha Schuster, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, head of comedy at ITV, said she realised uh, last year that an awful lot of my comedy entertainment shows are made up of all-male riding teams. Yep. Uh, they can all, all too often be a sense of token, tokenism towards the lone female, she wrote on a comedy website, or the dominant perception is that the female is there purely so the production can hit quotas. To solve this pro- problem of quotas, she's proposed more quotas, uh, and she's now saying that um, you know to move towards 50-50 gender representation, ITV will no longer have all-male comedy writing teams. Yep. I reckon we need... We, would, we need some more women on this writing team because, you know, we're getting stale. Yeah. So well, just probably, anything. Any, yeah, any just help will do. Anything at all. Um, I, here's what I go. So she goes, um, last year when reviewing the gender balance of sitcom scripts, she, she was saying she realized that for every script she received from a female writer, she got five from men. Mm-hmm. And so I don't get why the response is to limit the ones from men. Well, shouldn't it be just to more encourage women yeah. to put it forward? Like, yep. why is it bring the male down rather than lift the female figures up? That's rather exactly than just right. like. Yeah, bring the mail down to reflect that there is no problem. Yeah. I well, don't get that part. I don't understand that bit either. Like, yeah, actually, you've really put that quite well. Thank you. <laughs> For once. No, just I've kidding. saved it from the cryptocurrency chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going well. So... And writer Brona C. Titley had been brought into the team for the ITV's panel show Cel- Celebability. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. So it's an ITV panel show. She goes... I haven't missed an episode. Sounds, well, am- sounds amazing. <laughs> okay. She said, if you have the same type of writers in terms of race or sexual orientation or gender, then you're only getting one kind of joke. Is that... Don't think so. What? Yeah. So all women laugh at exactly the same thing. A- and in unison... <laughs> <laughs> and all men and they will have absolutely no way to know what to laugh at if a male writes it that is I don't, I'm not sure that's true I don't think that's true either it's <laughs> a bit regressive that kind of thing no I don't buy that so anyway look they really told us to do whatever they want obviously uh, and it would be great if there were more female comedy writers yes uh, alright uh, and then the final story we're going to get through so Carl Kashuv People might remember him. Well pronounced. Thank you. Um, we definitely didn't spend <laughs> five minutes Googling how to pronounce it before the show started. Uh, so Carl Kashuv, uh, people might remember him after the Parkland school shooting. He was one of the people that uh, sort of, uh, you know, he's survived. A survived survi- yeah, he's a survivor of it. He got into the media a lot talking about gun control. You had uh, David Hogg and, uh, on the left and then you had Carl Kashuv on the right. That was basically what it was. But anyway, Carl Kashuv gets into Harvard. He applied and accepted into Harvard University. And it was now rescinded after Harvard discovered that uh, Kashuv, now 18, used racial slurs and texts, Skype conversations, and Google documents when he was 16. Mm-hmm. And they've said, no more. You're, you're not in Harvard. You're gone. Yeah. Don't ever send those messages would be number one thing. Yeah. But sorry, it's just like, I don't, it's another example of everyone is doomed. Because if you anything like if, if you went through everyone's entire online chats, mm-hmm. you're going to find something you can take out of context and ruin someone's life. Yeah, and this is just another example of it. Well, and I think that um, organisations like Harvard should be more forgiving of yeah. people. So this guy, he, the only reason this is a thing is because he's a conservative activist in favour of less gun control. Yeah, um, and he is. You know, he apologised for this stuff that he sent, which he definitely shouldn't have sent. It was bad stuff. Uh, he was only 16 at the time. He said he was sorry. And the only reason this is happening is because he's an activist. Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, I don't know. Like, where, where does this end, as you say? Like, there's just, you know, this is going to get everyone eventually. Exactly. Or just eventually we as a society go, you know what? Let's just stop leaking people's personal messages because it, anyone, like the person that leaked this to Harvard, if you went back and leaked, got into that guy's account or yeah. person's account, you could probably take them down as well. Well, it was an effort from the far right and the far left, to be honest, because he's got far right opponents who are also sort of putting pressure on Harvard for, for to get him to get rid of him. So, yeah. so I mean, I'm sure they've got some interesting text floating around. Yes, but um, look and look, you know, this person did it when they were 16. Are we really saying that think crimes you make when you're 16 are going to affect you for the rest of your life? That sounds pretty bad. Um, that's all I've got. Yeah, cool. All right, so that is it. Oh, for sorry. No, my final point. Oh, okay. <laughs> As Ben Shapiro pointed out, yep. Harvard have like ex-cons. You know, they've given ex-cons second chances, which is like a good thing. Yeah. But not someone who's made stupid texts. But did, yeah, well, those ex-cons never said anything on Google Documents, so. 
Uh, all right, that's it for the start of the show. So we'll now go to our interviews with Nick Minchin and Deanna Vonich. Uh, before we do, a quick rundown of what the IPA has been talking about this week. And there's been a lot of stuff about what Scott Morrison, Scott Morrison said about red tape. Mm-hmm. So Daniel Wilde's been hard at work. He had an article in The Australian this morning. And he had a media release when the speech was made. So you can go back and read those. And you also got uh, John Roskam in The Australian Financial Review, his fortnightly article. You can read that on the IPA website talking about the ASIC decision to have a... Um, what is it? Like, it's like a psychologist that sits on company boardrooms mm. and just dictates what culture is, yeah. which is very creepy. We're never up for the show <laughs> just to make sure that we're, you know. Just in a good place. We've got a good culture. Yeah. Well, I don't think we, yeah. I, Do we have I, a good culture? I think we have a culture that makes mm. us put a podcast out each week, mm-hmm. but whether or not it's a healthy one, that, you know, it's, it's the drive that gets you up. Yeah. But at what cost? Are we helping Burjo flourish to be. Burjo 100 Burjo? Do you feel you've grown in the few weeks? He's got a microphone. Do you feel you've grown or shrunk as a person since you joined this podcast? flourished. Still making my wind up, to be honest, James. Yeah, okay. There's there's evidence on both sides. (laughs) It's all just frantically running over (laughs) to get some microphone correction happening. Uh, All right. uh, Did I have anything else? Yeah, so... Last week was a huge week for podcasting here at the IPA. So you had the regular episodes of the Young IPA podcast and Looking Forward. So mm. hopefully you've subscribed to uh, Looking Forward as well and you heard our one and their one. And you also had two special editions. So you had the special interview with Joffa, which we aired. I mean, that was the whole mystery guest segment if you were listening to that little uh, to and fro. So uh, we had the Joffa interview. If you haven't had a chance, to go back and listen to that. And Misty's 1045. That's why we... Yes, uh, but we got him eventually and that's all that matters. Uh, so, and if you are new to the show from the Joffa interview, hopefully stick around. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you're, uh, you know, uh, telling your friends and family about the show as well. And looking forward, had the big episode with Dr. Peter Ridd. That came out on Friday. You can also watch that on YouTube. Dr. Peter Reid talking about his legal case with James Cook University, uh, what that means for academic freedom and what this sort of means for the next generation of Peter Reids who want to say something about uh, you know science and climate change and the Great Barrier Reef but are too scared because of uh, all the potential costs to their career. So there's that and... Yeah, so make sure you're downloading those. Make sure you subscribe to both. And if you are listening through Apple Podcasts or iTunes, make sure you're leaving us that five-star review. It really helps us out with the ratings and helps new people come to the show. Thank you. Okay, we're now joined by Nick Minchin, former government minister and now chairman of the Responsible Wagering Australia. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, uh, the Freedman Conference, Australian Libertarian Society as well. Uh, we know that there's a morning tea about to break out into this room at any minute, so if it does get a little noisy for the listeners, that's what that is. We haven't just attracted a crowd of onlookers. Uh, but anyway, so Chairman of Responsible Wagering Australia, which is committed to ensuring that Australia has the best conducted, socially responsible wagering industry in the world. So my first question is, can I have my lost gambling money back? <laughs> <laughs> Not if you've lost it, mate. That's the point of gambling. You take a gamble, if you lose it, it's gone. Look, I lost a multi because Sacramento Kings couldn't hold on to a 17-point lead in the fourth quarter, okay? If you're into social responsibility, then I should have my money back. <laughs> well, you studied your form hard and I'm sure made an educated and wise, you know, bet on a team that unfortunately didn't make it. Hey, you know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. All right, uh, but seriously, what are the challenges to the wagering industry in Australia at the moment? Well, the online wagering industry is, of course, growing uh, rapidly. It's going gangbusters. Um, You know, it's a very exciting, interesting, uh, technologically sophisticated industry with some significant players in it, a lot of international companies, seeing Australia as a real growth market. Um, So the take-up of online wagering here has been really significant. Um, It's a highly competitive industry, so for those companies that are in it they know they're really in a competition you know so from a free market point of view it's a terrific industry um their their margins are relatively thin um that's why you see them advertising heavily because they're all competing like crazy with each other for business for a growing business yeah Uh, are there any pushbacks from government i know like uh, gambling is one of the biggest uh you know when sin taxes get bought up it's always gambling and whenever like oh we've got to restrict advertising we don't know who's watching it uh gambling's the number one thing so do you get much pushback from government well look Gambling, like a number of other industries, is one of the most heavily regulated industries in Australia. There are a lot of restrictions on what um, gambling companies can do, whether it's in the poker machine space or the online wagering space. So, yeah, there's, you know, we have to work closely with the communications department and others, uh, state departments, territory departments, you know, um, who are all concerned to make sure that this is... Um, 
a well-regulated industry. So that's, that's the, one of the reasons for forming the body, Responsible Wagering Australia, is, is as an interface between the government uh, between governments and the industry itself. So it's the industry body for the companies. And a lot of our dealings are with government departments and government ministers to make sure they understand the industry's concerns. The industry wants to work with government and understands you know, the pressures on governments in this area. Uh, we want a well-regulated, efficiently re regulated industry um, without you know, going down the path of the nanny state where you try and ban it or um, you know, unduly restrict it. Yeah, because gambling's always been sort of an Australian way of life, especially sports wagering. So uh, long-term prospects, are you saying uh, there's going to be you know, more nanny state or are you th thinking there's going to be less just based on your dealings with everyone? Look, I, I, I think the industry is well positioned at the moment because most of these companies, you know, really do have a, a high standard of ethics and integrity. They, they understand that, you know, there's a, um, a social licence at work here. And if they want to continue to operate in Australia, they've got to exhibit the highest standards they can. So, look, I'm, I'm very optimistic for the industry. Um, um, there may be some shakeout in terms of the number of players here because, as I say, it is very competitive. But the growth in the industry is significant. Australians enjoying the capacity. I regard, you know, this online wagering as just a form of entertainment. Instead of going to the movies, you check the form and you place a bet, you know. And, uh, and a lot of Australians love doing that. And why shouldn't they be able to do that? So our point is to say, yeah, we accept that there's got to be some regulation. Governments will want to get some tax take from, from this industry. But, you know, remember, these are ordinary Australians who want to, you know, gamble. And, and it's their right to gamble. Um, yeah. One thing I want to talk about is like there's a cultural thing as well where when we talk about like how much money Australians spend on cigarettes, it's how much money people spend on cigarettes and when it's alcohol, it's spend on alcohol. But the second gambling gets brought up, it turns into what you've lost. Yeah. Like, uh, so what, have you found that as well and what, it, what would your reaction be to that? Well, well the anti-gambling lobby always talks about how many dollars Australians have lost. Well, no, they've decided to spend their entertainment dollar on, on this form of entertainment. Uh, the thing about online wagering, it's different to poker machines or anything like that because you, if you do any on online wagering, no, you really do study the form. You know, I, I bet on football and I go through the form, I work out which teams I want to support and I, and I make an educated um, bet on, uh, on the outcome based on, you know, what sort of odds the various companies are offering. So it's, in that sense, it's, it's, uh, it's a quite sophisticated form of entertainment and you are investing money in it rather than... You know, why, if you go to the cinema and, and, and Australians spend, you know, billions on going to the cinema, is that lost money? No, it's just that's the way they entertain themselves. People who put money on, you know, basketball teams or football teams are, um, you know, they're, they're entertaining themselves by doing that and many of them get a return. They come out better. You don't get your money back when you go to the movies. No, no. And in some cases, you absolutely should, uh, looking at you, uh, World War Z. Anyway, um, the other one I want to talk to you about, I, I'm not exactly sure what the actual law is, but every time you want to place a live bet in Australia, you seem to have to talk to an employee at the... Cus at the am I wrong with that? Um, like sports bet, when, if when I put a live, live bet, bet, like the game's going on at the moment, I have to call instead of being able to place a... Yeah, the... the, the, the there is no in-play betting allowed. Yeah, yeah okay. The, I might ask yeah. that question again because... Sure. I'm, uh, one particular thing about regulations around gambling in the moment is live betting. So in other form, like before a game starts, you can just bet on your phone. But once it, once it starts, you have to talk to an employee or talk to a human being about it or do some other form of communication. Now, uh, what I found with my, like, this is what I want to bring up with like, unintended consequences of some of these betting. Because the second I start talking to someone, I feel I need to up my stake just to impress <laughs> them. So my first question is, uh, why do I need other people's approval so badly? And then two, uh, what are the, un like, are these some of the unintended consequences of uh, these regulations? Well, the, the, the federal government has had a ban on uh, in what's called in-play betting, i.e. the capacity to bet online on a sporting event that's currently taking place. And um, despite there being a number of inquiries and reviews and reports suggesting the government should reconsider that, uh, they haven't done it. And they've had an opportunity recently and they've decided not to do it. Um, we think that's a bit anomalous given that you can go and bet on horses, you can go down to the corner TAB and, and, and bet in play you can and the trouble with banning it here and this is like a lot of things when you prohibit something they just find another way to do it so people are going offshore to do it with often illegal you know bookies overseas who are offering that service back into australia 
So technically they're breaking the law by doing it, but it's easy for customers to do it. If they really want to bet on a, on a football match that's currently in play, you know, I'll bet on how much the team's going to win by or something, they can actually do it. So that's why we've been saying to governments, wouldn't it be better for the highly regulated you know, um, companies that are operating here in Australia under an Australian licence to be able to offer this service rather than their customers going offshore? Um, and in any event, if they want to, they can just go down to the corner TAB to do it anyway. So that's, that's one of the issues, you know, we think we'll keep talking to the government about. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm a huge basketball fan, and one thing that the NBA has done recently is they've embraced sports betting. They yeah. try to deny its existence, basically, but now they're like, okay, we're in, as long as we can get 1% of profits. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to give the NBA a whole lot more money. It's going to have yeah. fans interact with the sport in a whole new different way. What, what, have your been, uh, what are your dealings with popular codes in Australia, like the AFL or the NRL or A-League? Are they open to the idea of sports betting, or are they a bit yeah. uh, sceptical about it? No, no, no. The, the, the um, sports in Australia uh, have embraced online wagering. A uh, number of the, the, the online wagering companies are sponsors of sporting teams or sporting codes. Um, you know, racing and other sports get a return from, um, from online wagering. Um, so there's a very good partnership and it works both ways, works to the benefit of both. And, you know, that's, that's why I think in America you've now seen the wall the dam will break and an embracing of uh, online wagering there. They've been slow to, to get to this point. But it's because a lot of sports will, will really benefit from this. And that's one of the keys. And, it's, and from the NBA's point of view, it's silly that in Australia we can bet on the NBA, but Americans couldn't. So, you know, so, you know reality had to break through at some point. Who do you back? This um, uh, no, gigantic Denver Nuggets fan. <laughs> I've been a Cavs fan for uh, since I was 17 when I went to school in Cleveland. Well, you've had a good run, but I think you could have a very long winter. It doesn't look too good. Uh, all right, I want to change tracks for a second. So, um, yeah, you're a former government minister. Uh, so, you must have, like, what were you thinking with last weekend's election? Like, were you confident going in? What time did you think you guys might be up? Uh, what was that? Yeah, well, I've got a whole lot of smart-ass friends who all say, oh, yeah, I picked it, I picked it, rubbish. Uh, I was like many. I thought the Liberal Party might get close. The best we could probably do would be 73 seats and we might be able to form a minority government. I didn't see a majority uh, coming. And it's, it's, you know, it's to Scott Morrison and his team's enormous credit that they've managed to do that. I've got to say, Labor threw this away. Um, the last six years haven't been, as a Liberal, lifelong Liberal, I've got to say the last six years haven't been great. And the opportunity was really there for Labor to win this. And you can see why they're if <laughs> devastated. But, you know, the, uh, Morrison ran a great campaign. It's vindication of the parliamentary party to deciding to change leaders last August, because I don't think Malcolm Turnbull could have done this. Um, so all hail to, to Scott Morrison. And I'm, I'm just relieved the Australian people and the country a spared three years of short and trade union government, which I think would have been devastating for the country. Yeah, how do you think Labor lost that election? They, uh, I think, because they got so close in 2016 when Turnbull lost, you know, 14 seats or whatever it was, uh, they all thought, oh, aren't we brilliant? And uh, all our tax policies are really, you know, quite popular. And Shorten's a terrific leader. They would have knocked Shorten off at that point if they'd done badly in 2016. Instead, they kept him because they did well in 2016. So in a way, we've got. <laughs> Shorten to thank, or Malcolm Turnbull to thank. And uh, so they stuck with some of these lousy tax policies. They stuck with Shorten. They were hubristic. They really thought, you know, because of the chaos in the Liberal Party, that they, they were a shoe in to win. Uh, it was, you know, I was in America in 2016, throughout the 2016 campaign. It was so like watching Hillary Clinton's Democrat campaign to see what Labor were doing. Clinton thought she was just, this was a coronation, you know, she's just going to walk into office. And I reckon Bill Shorten and his mob thought the same thing. And, geez, you know, uh, hubris will always bring you down. Yeah, yeah, that uh, video of him saying I'm the next Prime Minister, Donald Schwarzenegger, has really <laughs> aged terribly. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure Malcolm Turnbull's going to be very thankful that you personally thanked him for the I'm Liberal win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't wait for his reaction to that one. Uh, I also, so, you know, uh, you, you were a minister under Howard. Like, uh, you stood around one of the greats in Liberal Party history. Does Scott Morrison's victory out of nowhere in this put him in that pantheon? Oh, it, like maybe not with Howard, but just like in the upper level of Liberal Party figures. Well, look, John Howard had 12 years, what, 12 years in government yeah. and proved himself in government. Scott's only been in office for nine months, 10 months. You've got to prove yourself in office. 
Uh, it's not just about winning elections. Elections are the means to the end. Election victories are the means to good government. What we all want to see now is three years of good government, good, stable, uh, productive government. And, you know, for all Liberals, the last six years have not produced that. So now the, the Parliamentary Liberal Party's got a chance to prove they can govern this country well and uh, with stability, and, and I'm optimistic they can do that. Um, and if, and if um, Scott Morris can, can prove that over the next three years, well, he's, he's definitely right up there. Yeah, what are the, some of the policy areas that you'd per, like you're really looking at to prove Scott Morrison's worth? Well, I, look, I, I do think they've got, to, um, they've got to get a productivity agenda. I, I worry that the Australian economy is a bit too much like a Ponzi scheme built on high immigration and residential you know, construction and infrastructure construction. That's not the basis of a highly productive economy. So they've got to, you know, get back to, you know, tin tax and have a real productivity agenda, in my view. And the Productivity Commission is one of the most fantastic institutions in this country and it's got a whole agenda there and they ought to go and tap on their door and, and, and check it out. So, you know, in tax, industrial relations, microeconomic reform, you know, the, the biggest challenge they've got is, 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 of course, climate and energy. They, they are committed to getting energy prices down and they just have to get energy prices under control. Um, but, you know, I, th I think they've adopted a relatively good position there, although I think there's more they can do. Um, so there's plenty of challenges, but, um, and, and of course, you know, people forget Australia might be, um, you know, whatever it is, the 11th biggest economy in the world, but we, we are subject to what goes on out there. Uh, the main thing we've got to hope is there isn't an international recession, but the US is going gangbusters under Trump. It's incredible, the performance of the American economy. I think he'll resolve the uh, dispute with China. It's time this dispute was had. I think I'm right. I think Trump is absolutely right to bring this on with China. So um, assuming the world economy continues to bubble along, um, the Australian economy performs well, Morrison's got every chance for re-election in 2022. All right, cool. Uh, so you're here at the uh, Freeman Conference talking about climate, and I think that's how a lot of people, uh, you know, my age would know you is from that uh, the ABC climate change documentary all those years ago. I mean, that was you mean a you bit, watched it? yeah, I, 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 like it was a pretty viral moment. I thought like it definitely dominated social media for a while. But what were your experiences doing that? And do you feel a bit vindicated uh, putting that state and then the big climate election right now? And you know, climate seems to have like, well, not climate has lost, but the climate change hysteria seems to have lost. Well, it was a fa fascinating exercise to, to do that documentary and to be taken around the world to meet some of the, my heroes in this thing, like, you know, Dick Lindzen and others. Um, uh, what, you know, and I travelled with Anna Rose, who was the uh, protagonist for the climate uh, alarmists. And, you know, I, I like Anna and, and, and I respect her passion for a cause. But what always worries me is they're so fanatical and they're not open to reason and they're not open to argument and they're not prepared to reconsider their position. And facts don't seem to matter, you know. You, you, you point out some of the just basic elements of, of climate science, and they just don't want to know about it. So it's it's so in that sense, this election victory is very important in, in um, showing that climate alarmism will does not is not a passage to victory for left wing parties. That what matters to ordinary people is actually you know a job and a salary and a. a <clears throat> stable economy. Nevertheless, uh, people on our side of politics mustn't over overread it, and and we've got to understand there are still a lot of people out there who've been indoctrinated through the education system to believe the world is about to end. You know? so I, I just think you've got to keep. Um, you can never let up on messaging about the reality of a Australia's position. Nothing Australia can do will change the climate or the weather one iota. Um, and that the question of why the climate changes, and the climate is always changing, is a massive scientific question that is not answered by suggesting there's a dial marked CO2 and you just turn that dial and you control the climate. I mean, that, that proposition is frankly nonsensical. And, and I think everybody on the conservative or centre-right side of politics has got to continue to make that case. All right, brilliant. Nick, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And final check, the Sacramento Kings bet. Like, I can get that back. Surely there's someone I can talk to. <laughs> Mate, hang in there. You know, you've got to hang. You've got to be loyal. And <laughs> 
Okay, we now welcome onto the show Deanna Vonich. Now, it's been a while since we did a get to know IPA staff kind of segment on the show, so really good to get these back. So, Deanna, you're with us while you're studying a uh, journalism degree. So, what made you want to work at the IPA? Bit formal first off, but we like to keep this like close to a job interview as possible. <laughs> Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm a long-time <laughs> listener. <laughs> oh, very good. That's good. <laughs> Write that down. She's the one. Write that down. Um, yeah, so I'm studying a Bachelor of Communication in Journalism at Deakin. Um, so I'm in my second and final year. Um, and I wanted to work at the IPA um, because I've been a member um, since about seven years ago and I've attended some of your events. Um, and I like the work that you do and I enjoy listening to your podcast. Fantastic, Dee. That's, that's great. A couple of great mentions there for us. <laughs> uh, no, so what, we, press clippings. what made you become interested in liberalism and freedom and those kind of ideas? Um, so after I finished year 12, um, I did one year of an arts degree um, before beginning a law degree mm -hmm. um, and I did a lot of units about politics and policy studies um, and I found I was more interested in the units about um, ideologies rather than Australian politics. So uh, one thing we were talking about off air was you had a, like an online spat with uh, Clementine Ford and some of her Twitter followers. So do you want to tell us that story? Sure. Um, so um, at uni we were doing some digital media units um, and some assessment about um, your online presence and part of that was Googling yourself. Um, so I did that um, and I found a tweet from Clementine Ford telling me to shut up. Oh, so you didn't even realise at the time? No. Okay. Um, so I'd written, uh, I've written probably about 40 letters to the editor now that have been published in the Herald Sun. Yep. Um, and that was part of the reason why... I thought I should study journalism after I had the spat with Clementine. Mm -hmm. um, so she noticed it. Um, I, I didn't know who she was at the time until I looked her up. Not a whole lot of people in Australia do, so don't worry about so that. I think she was working for um, the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, and, yeah, so I got a bit of um, bad attention from her and her followers. So um, what was the original letter about, the one that Clem? had to go at? Yeah, so I, I wrote a number of letters um, about Australia Day. Um, so just the push in recent years to change the date of Australia Day and to call it Invasion Day really grinds my gears. So um, I wrote a number of letters about that. Um, obviously, I disagree with it. Um, and I think I speak for my fellow WOGs who... <laughs> um, who, you know, are recent arrivals and to this country who um, were naturalised on January 26 and um, who had no part in um, the crimes of the British against the Aborigines. Um, yeah, that's not what we're celebrating on Australia Day um, and it holds a different significance to us completely. Um, and so unfortunately, um, Clementine didn't understand that. Um, yeah, and then there were a lot of nasty comments um, on Twitter as well, um, just likening me to a Nazi and calling me a redneck. And so obviously um, they just don't understand that we have a different um, different view of Australia Day. Fantastic stuff. So you mentioned there that you're a, a new arrival to Australia. Why don't you tell people uh, about your family background? Because it's a pretty interesting story. Sure. Um, so um, I'm first generation, but uh, my parents um, came from Croatia mm -hmm. um, and, along with their parents. Um, so technically they were economic migrants and they came on a ship with the so-called 10-pound palms. Um, but uh, more realistically, they were refugees um, because they were fleeing um, a communist regime. Um, obviously, it didn't break out into ethnic cleansing until the mid-90s, but from the 70s onwards, um, there was certainly um, a cultural genocide. Um, you know, people weren't allowed to practice their religion. Um, people had their farms taken off them by the government. Um, and if you spoke out against the communist government, you'd go missing. Um, so those were the sorts of things uh, they were escaping. 
Um, and my father-in-law um, is also a refugee from Hungary, um, from communism as well. Right. Yeah, wow. Um, so you said before you've written 40 letters to the editor. That's I, very I find that, That's a high number of letters to the editor. <laughs> yeah. So do you really enjoy doing that? <laughs> um, yeah, I do. Um, I've just always really enjoyed reading the um, opinion section of the paper um, and the letters. And um, yeah, up until recently, I wasn't really on social media. So if I saw something that I liked or didn't like, I would write a letter. What kind of stuff are we talking um, yeah, everything from Australia Day um, to identity politics to um, cyclists on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> the three big issues of our time. Yep. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of cyclist stuff are we talking? Just uh, Bad cyclist behaviour. Oh, okay. Um, you and Scott Hargraves are going to have a few. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Scott Hargraves he loves the cyclist, so maybe steer clear of him. But. <laughs> Uh, do you have a particular favourite letter to the editor you've written, one that really encapsulates uh, what you bring to the table as a political commentator? Um, yeah, sure. So it was one of the letters I wrote about Australia Day. There's been a few of them. Um, it's an annual occurrence now. Um, but um, it, was, it was the larger featured letter of the day and it received a lot of... Um, people writing back to it oh really yeah um and so it received a lot of kudos um from other um european australians i suppose um and um people who'd come as as migrants um fairly recently and they all um shared shared my my view um and yeah they just said they were tired of um white anglo australians telling them how they should feel um about um, about Australia Day um, and I guess uh, some of them just don't um, share our attitude in wanting to genuinely be a part of this country um, and focusing on um, what unites us instead of what separates us and um, celebrating our multi-ethnic um, society. Fantastic, very well said. So we sort of talked a little bit before about uh, the abuse you copped online as a result of this letter. What makes you think that these people want to, why do you think these people rather than, you know, simply disagreeing with someone, want to absolutely eviscerate someone they don't even know who wrote a letter to the editor? Um, what, what do you think drives that real kind of hatred, I guess? Um, I think they just um, live within a bubble um, where um, they just don't understand that other people hold different views. Um, and perhaps there is a lot of, um, I guess, white guilt or, um, you know, people hating themselves or... <laughs> um, and I think they just like to pr project that on other people, um, not realising that uh, we may have a different background to them and we may have a different opinion to them. All right, brilliant. So you've written a lot of edit letters to the editor and that's uh, fueling what the journalism degree. So we're now yep. going to expand the word count on some of these uh, submissions into the paper. Yep. So have you found studying journalism today? Like are the people open to, you know, centre-right ideas or is it this is a narrative and you stick to it? A lot of people have mentioned to me at other universities um, that the teachers uh, have very left-wing views, um, but that's not been the case at Deakin University. Um, all my teachers have been really supportive um, of my ideas. Um, I don't know if they just enjoy reading something different or whether or, or whether they hold those beliefs themselves. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's been... They've been very supportive. Yeah, that's really good because I was having a look at a few of your uh, previous articles that you've written while at Deakin and some of them, you know... I wouldn't have oh, written them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have written them doing what my hardcore. arts degree at Melbourne Uni. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I think maybe one of the things is, you know, like Deakin's more in the outer suburbs. It's less of an establishment university. It makes sense perhaps that it's a little bit more, I guess, even-handed than some of the, you know, Sydney Uni, Melbourne Unis of the world. Yeah, and they're just supportive with letting us write whatever we're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a unit recently um, where we were able to write um, on whatever topic we want, as little or as much as we like um, um, f for the student newspaper. Um, so having that freedom is really good. Um, and uh, I just keep coming back to the same kinds of topics that I'm interested in. So if they say, 
go write an essay about marginalised voices in the media. Mm. They'll give examples such as women in sport or refugees or Indigenous people, but then I might write a paper about conservatives being shadow banned on Twitter or... Um, or abused know. by Clementine Ford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, or um, a, a theory that academics call the spiral of silence where um, young people uh, may have increasingly conservative views but they're afraid of political discourse, especially online and in the workplace because they are afraid of the negative consequences. Um, so they just keep quiet or... Um, they pretend to be um, perhaps more progressive than what they are in public. Any articles about uh, rabbits by any chance? Um, no articles about rabbits. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> Do you want to talk about Attila the Bun? Okay. <laughs> I might as well give Attila the Bun a plug. Um, I have a rabbit named Attila the Bun. Uh, he's a house rabbit. Incredible name for a rabbit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> um and he has about 4,000 followers on Twitter and he's very adorable um, and he has a really good attitude. So he has a good attitude. He does. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> Not like his namesake. He's tough, like his namesake. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we gave Attila the Bun the shout-out, so you need yep. to give this podcast a shout-out to Attila, Attila the Bun's followers because that is a popular bunny on social media. Yeah, right. that's right. He's got 4,000 followers, doesn't he, on Instagram? He does, yep. Yep. yes. Uh, cool. So, what if you're like you've been here for the IPA for a few weeks now? So, what have your impressions been about working at the IPA? Is it like meeting expectations, or is there anything <laughs> you, you terrific? Can't about? wait till it's over. <laughs> I've never worked in such a friendly environment with like-minded people before. Mm -hmm. um, coming from an office where uh, we share some space with a, a very sort of pro-union PR outfit. Um, I kind of feel like you can't express yourself there freely. Um, so that was my first impression of the IPA. Um, and it's a very laid back, friendly culture. Um, yeah, you can definitely express yourself quite freely at the IPA because you're <laughs> over near the policy, uh, the policy people mm. and opinions can fly pretty, qu <laughs> pretty quickly around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, most places I've worked... Um, Usually, you have to keep your opinions to yourself. Unfortunately, um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what would you say to other uh, students out there or young people that are thinking about maybe they want to do some part-time work at the IPA, like you're doing? Like, what would you say to them about whether or not they should do it? Um, they should definitely do it um, if they're interested in the IPA's values, uh, like I am. Um, and you don't have to uh, settle for uh, the positions that the university is offering. Um, so I personally wasn't interested in anything um, that they were advertising. So um, I just decided to go out and find my own internship and um, took that initiative. And I think, um, it, well, it definitely paid off. <laughs> That's fantastic. So here I am. That's fantastic. Just out of interest, what other places that they offer? Um, Let's name names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I've, being Deakin and being based in Geelong, there were a lot of um, sports-oriented um, positions, um, a lot of things to do with footy, um, and I don't know that much about footy. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also did a lot of tours um, through studios, um, the ABC um, and I think Nine as well. Um, and, yeah, I just wasn't really interested in anything um, at the ABC. So. Sounds yeah. good. Wonder why not. Anyway, uh, Deanna, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks. Until the bun. Until the bun. Check thank it you. out, people. Okay, thank you too, Nick Minchin and Deanna Vonich for those interviews. A lot of fun stuff. Um, all right, Pete, so let's talk some of the stories that have Really caught our eye this week, made us laugh. Pete, lead us off. Well, I've got a bit, I've got a presidential candidate we can all get around. We talk about small government uh, on this show. What about no government? Libertarian presidential candidate Adam Kokesh has vowed he would abolish the federal government and then resign on his first day if he's elected. Uh, he was on Fox Business. He said, America is too good for this government. It's time for us to be united in freedom instead of government. So he's got a few specifics. My proposal is to the localisation of government dissolving it through a bankrupt bankruptcy process in a peaceful, orderly manner that would leave us with 50 independent states and, of course, up to 562 sovereign 
Native Nations. Yeah, so you say he was going to do it on day one, but they said it is a day one thing. And he, he says, however, Kokesh's problem is actually a little more complicating than getting rid of it on day one. Mm. It's, it's, got wow. to be, it's got to be day one. It has got to be day one. You can't water down the day one aspect of this. If you were, if you come into office on the Tuesday, you've you've messed up. Well, look, I sort of I, I take your point, but I mean, if, how's he going to dis- dissolve it through a bankruptcy process in one day? Just, just you just. Want I'm to just pull saying. Trigger. If, if if you want to make the necessary media cut through, you can't be watering down day one promises. Well, the amount of things that get promised on like on day one, I'm going to do X. Like mm. day one must be the busiest job of any leader's day ever because oh, yeah. like the amount of things they promise they have to do on day one. So for this guy of early. all people, <laughs> of all people to say it's not so much a day one thing, it is a day one thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not getting any votes. He's got to aim to. Be out of there by like lunchtime. Like, as yeah, well. you just going to be in the pub just after lunch. lunch. Yeah, and look, but I mean, who's going to go get your morning day? coffee and don't come back? Yeah, because you've already signed the document. That's right. No, I couldn't agree more. You know, I don't. Who's going to organise Harmony Day? Who's going to organise those clear bins they had in the WA? Yeah, to see what people, what stuff people were having. Uh, who's going to make the take that fella on the Sunshine Coast take down that basketball ring? Yeah, exactly. Oh, so are you against this? Because this would mean a lot more power for local governments to do stupid things. No, no, no. I'm for this. Okay. <laughs> oh, they were rhetorical questions, oh, James. Oh, right. Okay, fair yeah. enough. So this is going smooth, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, cool. All right, that is that one. So good luck to him. Yeah. But yeah, if I'm his media guy, I'm just saying, make sure you stick to the line. This is a day one thing. Yeah, okay. All uh, right. Good point. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, John Cusack had himself a day on Twitter a few days ago. So you know the actor. You've seen some of his movies. What are some of his movies just for the punters out there? High Fidelity is definitely one I've seen. Oh, yeah, Nick Hornby. And uh, I don't remember the other ones, but High Fidelity is a very good movie. Yeah, if you, I know who he is, so yes. you should. Yeah, <laughs> if Pete knows who he is, that is the highest indicator of man's fame I've ever heard. Yeah. Pete has not seen... Any movie. No, I googled to make sure, but I was pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. like He's got good hair. Anyway, uh, so John Cusack retweeted a meme that was, it, it's like this old quote that gets attributed to Voltaire. He didn't say, it, but it's like to learn over who to learn who rules over you. Simply find out who you are not allowed to criticize. And it's like a, a hand holding down people, but the hand has the star of David on it. Mm. And Cusack retweets it, saying, "Follow the money." Yeah. Uh, bad move. Yeah. Bad move. Very ugly. Now, he followed it up a few days ago saying, uh, uh, a bot got me. A bot got me. What is, what is that? Uh, I thought I was endorsing a pro-Palestinian justice retweet of another earliest post. Uh, I, I came thinking from a different source. Shouldn't have retweeted. Hmm. So, a bot got him. Yeah. I mean, but what I don't get is that when he originally retweeted it, he then spent a few replies defending his right to retweet that thing. He defended it for ages. He defended it for way too long. A tweet for <laughs> plural tweets. Yeah. Until eventually his agent rang up and said, John, what are you, what yeah. are you doing? And then went with a bot got me. Yeah. <laughs> like, just a, just one mean? of those bots that gets yeah, people. Oh, geez. If only that bot hadn't got me. Yeah. No, so that quote that, that you said was from Voltaire, it's attributed to Voltaire, but it's not him. It's actually some far right. Leader. Yeah. So. Uh, bad was, day for John Cusack. It was a bad day. It was from an alt-right account. And uh, is that what they say, ate the trash? Is that a thing? Uh, that's when you uh, retweet like what's someone purporting to be a genuine news story. Mm-hmm. So if you like nine news, but it's nine news 06 something, yeah. and you go, wow, what a story. Bang. Yeah, like Scott Morrison caught in doing this. That would be <laughs> eating the trash. This is just uh, garbage. Okay. <laughs> this is just pure swill. Yeah. <laughs> and then going, a bot. Yeah, yeah. You didn't even go that hacked. You went. I got t- had by a bot. Yeah, I don't. So like, what does this that is mean? literally my first time on Twitter. What does that imply? I have no idea what that implies. Like I've been on Twitter for a while. I have no idea what could possibly be he mean by I got caught by a bot. Never got never got caught by a bot yourself. No, no. Okay. <laughs> this is not a thing. All right. Well, we'll have to make sure that doesn't happen. All right. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Let's move on to the last one. So gender stereotypes have been banned from ads. Well, and look, there's advertising people all across the UK suing, saying, "What are we going to do now?" You know, because I mean, if there's one thing advertising folk lean on, yep. it is the gender stereotype. Yeah, chicks take ages to get ready. Am I right, fellas? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, so well, can I'm, I say the most like the most overwhelming stereotype is dad doesn't know things. Oh yeah, dad's stupid. Yeah, yeah. 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 Classic. So uh, look, though, I can understand why they're worried. In the UK, a de- uh, sorry, a UK, a ban on harmful gender stereotypes has come into effect. So this was sort of mooted a few months ago. Has now come into effect. Uh, the UK advertising watchdog, the Advertising Standards Authority, wrote, our evidence shows how harmful gender stereotypes in ads can contribute to inequality in society. I'd like to say that evidence. 
our evidence. Yeah, I'd like to say it. Uh, put simply, we found that some portrayals in ads can over time play a part in limiting people's potential. Uh, so they used this example, a 2017 television advert for Aptopil baby milk, Aptomil baby milk even, formula, which showed a baby girl growing up to be a ballerina and baby boys growing up to be engineers and mountain climbers. What's wrong with ballerinas, James? Nothing, Pete. Nothing is wrong with them. You know, you have to be strong, you have to be brave, you have to take risks. Imagine a society where young girls aspire to have those qualities. Yeah, exactly. Where the would other, we be? The one for me is, so they go, okay, if you show a negative, uh, if you show a stereotype, mm. bad. So, yes. Right. Let, let me paint you a picture. So you can't Paint have, me a word picture. Paint me, look, <laughs> verbal meme. But anyway, uh, so... Instead of having a woman change a diaper, you have a man, right? Or, or a nappy, because we're in Australia. Oh, a nappy, yes. <laughs> Another one. But anyway, so you have a, a you have a man changing the nappy instead of the woman, because okay. you don't want to do the stereotype. But isn't having a man doing that at, in, in a way an admission that usually a woman would do that, because otherwise you'd be showing the woman? Yeah. So you acknowledge that it's a stereotype, because otherwise you wouldn't be having the man. Yeah, because you can't do the woman. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't do the woman. Can't the woman. Sorry, you do the man, but that is, in effect, uh, acknowledging that it's usually the woman. That's sexist. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There is no way that. you can do this, except unless the baby changes its own nappy, well, and then what kind of world are we living in? Maybe they I'm should. supposed to believe a baby na- changes its own nappy? Why can't that's a baby change its own nappy? Because it has no dexterity. <laughs> what have you got with, against <laughs> babies taking control of their own well, lives? Well, I just also don't think they're in the market to buy nappies, which is what we're trying to do when we advertise. Yeah, well, look, I don't know, mate. So do you see what is happening here? I see what that. If the, what if it's a female baby changing their own nappy? Is that a stereotype? And then you have the male oh, change yeah. its own nappy. And then that's also acknowledging the stereotype. So no nappies are getting changed. And the thing about this law is it's pretty vague. Yes. So like, it's not actually stipulated what's going to be okay and what's not. Yeah, because this strikes me as a law that was really drafted to get some nice retweets. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, wait, we actually have power over this. This is bad. What are we going to do? do? Yeah. And rather, they've got evidence though. So um, I would like- stereotypes. There is one bit, which was sort of in this Vox article about it, which was even the Vox people were like, oh, this is a bit odd. Um- Somewhat when Vox is saying that it's a bit odd, yeah. that should be an indicator to you. Yeah, well, that's right. Somewhat yeah. unrelated to gender stereotypes, this new rule also bans ads that, quote, connect physical features with success in the romantic or social spheres. i got bad news for you oh, people. <laughs> Kids, I hate to be the better of bad news. Yeah, but it does. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, that's just some ugly bloke at the back going, yeah. but oh, this is crap as well. And they go, uh, okay, yeah, we'll put that in too. And then yeah. Like, but, well. yeah, again, Barry, we're sorry. We're sorry what happened, but yeah. uh yeah, we'll make sure. Develop a personality. Yeah, exactly. Um yeah, that's what you do. Yeah, exactly. That, that should be the lesson. Is yeah. to say, look, the what? beautiful people are never gonna realise what you need to be a person like what you need to have a good personality. Yeah, exactly. They're out of the disadvantage. Exactly. Like when you hit thirty, it's all good. And I then- hope. <laughs> This is getting a bit deep now, but do you remember we talked about the cunning fat kids yes. a few weeks ago? Yeah, exactly. You've got to learn angles for dodgeball. Exactly yeah. right. And that's an advantage in the long run. Yeah. Uh, all right. That is it for the show this week. <laughs> that, that got into life advice. Was that in the brief? <laughs> was that the brief? We're going to make a podcast. You guys are going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, if it kicks out into life advice for people, <laughs> then you just inv- embrace that. We're not medical professionals. No. So, But we are life wizards yeah i don't know about that we are alive <laughs> all right uh that is it for the show this week uh thank you guys so much for listening and subscribing thank you to nick minchin and diana vonage mm-hmm. uh and thank you to all the new listeners that have come to us from joffa interview or just you know old listeners as well you're not unappreciated <laughs> uh and yeah so make sure you, it this podcast is available on all good podcast apps you can now also watch us on youtube make sure you subscribe to the ipa's youtube channel uh and make sure you're telling your friends and family about the show so you know if you've got the one friend who's like look Look, I only watch the Joe Rogan podcasts. I don't listen to them. Mm. They can now watch this podcast as well. And if you are listening through Apple Podcasts or iTunes, make sure you leave us that five-star rating. Helps us out with the show. All right. See you guys next week. See ya.